Say Carlton, hello to Leon Biner. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning, Leon. Hi. Good morning, Leon. I'm well, thank you. Excellent. Lovely to hear your voice. Likewise. Lovely. Indeed. Yeah. Yes. This um, uh, this uh, Qantas thing is going to ferment into a much bigger issue because, oh, sure it will. well, I've got some interesting information I can share with you. There are two very successful international players, that is airlines, who yep. want to do a lot more in Australia. Good. And, you know, if, if they're allowed to do it, mm-hmm. the price of fares could come down 35%, 40%. And what's the argument for not letting them do ah, it? Well, you see, there's a lot of obfuscation going on at the moment. Yeah. Here, here comes the government again, eh? Huh? Well, you see, you wonder in whose interests this is mm. because we're a vast country, as you know, and the travelling public need airfares that are affordable, especially Absolutely. for families. You know? Absolutely. You know, because if you've got, say, uh, two parents and a couple of children or more, mm. flying anywhere domestically is damn expensive, mm. very expensive. Mm. And, and I know that at least one international player wants to increase markedly the amount of flights and they're basically getting uh, shamrocked. Simple as that. Yeah. yeah. Is, that, is, is that quite hard? Yes. And there's another one too that's wanting to come in and Probably. do stuff. Look, I, I'm i waiting yeah. on a briefing later today from somebody in the airline sector who always gives me good, good information on this. This is all going to blow up because we are a very vast country for the size and population. Yeah. We've got huge distances between ports, particularly from coast to coast, mm. we we can't sustain airfares that people can't afford. But, but particularly when we don't no. have to. We if we if we have a mechanism through which sure. the, the airfares become more affordable, we should avail ourselves of that. See, there's a lot of businesses, as you know. There's not just the consumer that's important, but there's also tourism businesses. Oh, sure. And if we can bring in people and ferry them out. That's going to help tourism, it's beard nights, a whole range of things. Yep, yep. I, I'm waiting on some info later today because I think this is all going to blow up. I really yep, do. Yep, good point, good point. Well, Leighton, look after yourself. Thank you very much and look after yourself as well, Leon. I will. And, um, nice to hear you. Thank you. Same to you, mate. When you okay. can't find the friends to the radio. And if you can't find the friend, you just pick up the telephone and you can dial us up on 0491 65 68 60. Leon Biner is with me. Leon, we've found a, a, a couple of things from the past that might cause, is that you, right? to, <laughs> cause you to... Oh, no. oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You hit it twice. All right. Well, okay. this is either I'll nostalgic or embarrassing. I'll do this one first. Do, 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 do one of them. This is a longer one. Uh, Tony found these. Okay. Oh, all right, right here? Okay. Led Zeppelin 4 album from 5KA's album chart, which comes out again Friday. Going to California, 607 and a half. Radio 5KA. She recently swallowed an olive and was rushed to a maternity hospital. <laughs> With a figure like that, she could only have been one person. The witch queen of New Orleans. Mari, Mari, <laughs> Queen of New Orleans, Redbone. It's now 610. Direct from Melbourne, that great group. Phoenix, Winston Charles, Tollgate Hotel, Glen Osmond. Radio by KA. <laughs> A gold, 1971. Fox on the run. It's 14 <laughs> after 6 now. Hey, last winter, you know what me folks teeth sounded like? Oh, I was surprised. <laughs> Morrison, 
Medicines to Pillow, honey, long play, like a cannonball. 624 on 5KA, it's now 77 degrees. Tomorrow we can expect a fairly warm day, upper 80s expected top, and tonight's low in the low 60s. Everyone seems to be... Uh, memories? Oh, yeah. God, things have changed. Well, but what, the, the voice is so like John Law's. Yeah. Did you, did you uh, mean it to be? or did no. you Were you influenced by him? Oh, not really, because um, I actually replaced him when he had a very bad bout of uh, heart issues. Yes, in, I remember that. Sydney. That was 2UW, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, we managed to stay at number one for quite a while. He was away for a while. But, um, no, I, I've been given good advice over the years by some wonderful radio people, and many of them elders, who have said, do not emulate others. Be you. But you can't help being influenced by others. Oh, that's true. But you can be influenced. But you don't necessarily have to uh, model yourself in such a way no. that you adopt a lot of their idiosyncrasies. No. How did you start? You went to the country to begin with? Yeah. Yeah. I oh, see. Now, this is an interesting story because when I was in my early teens, I needed to get out of home a lot because I had a stepmom who didn't really get on with me well and the other way around too. Oh, yeah. So I found things to do. So what I did, I went to the Alfred Hospital Fate yeah. and I got onto the public relations area and did all their uh, loudspeaker PR. Ah, experience. Yes. Yes. And I did that for a couple of years and it was amazing the number of people came to me, including a very famous at the time Shakespearean actor by the name of John Bell who oh, walked yes. up to me and said... Son, you get in in radio, you do it, go and do it. And he gave me a couple of names and I rang them and they said, come and talk to us. So that's that's how that happened. You got the experience in the country, then you came back to Adelaide? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 What station to begin with? Oh, I worked in 3SR Shepparton. Yeah. See, we were lucky because that time, which was in the sort of mid-60s, you still had people who could teach you yes. and sort of mentor you. And uh, I was probably the last <clears> of a group that had the privilege of that happening because over time those people don't exist anymore. Everything's networked now. Yes. You don't really have. <laughs> the, the breakfast sessions might be local, but now it's all sort of networked everywhere. It wouldn't matter so much if it worked but these people yes. are so focused on the bottom line. I guess it's because they have accountants rather than show people. I, I think, and this has been proven time and time again, that if you're local mm. and you connect with the consumer wherever mm. he or she is, mm. you're going to do well because yeah. the connection is the really important thing. And then you add your clients and sponsors and ads to that and that can be very good. But unfortunately we do a lot what what's called networking, mm. and I think we lose out because, you know, uh, Shepparton's a big place and, and there's a lot of other country areas around yeah. Australia with big populations and uh, they're sophisticated communities. And the radio station mm. is an integral part yes. of that community. Yes. It always is and yes. that's how it started and I'm sure that's how the people would prefer it to be and I would imagine that the wise thing is always do what the people prefer. yes. Uh, but I look, local always wins, Jeremy. Yeah, as you you would know well. Yep, yep, yep. Because radio is that immediate uh, yes. interactive, yeah, interactive thing. It's, it it's... has no peer when yeah. it comes to immediacy. You know, if you want to know what's going on, uh, or something breaks, yes, everybody goes to the radio instant, not yes. the TV. <laughs> oh, no, not the TV. We don't have to worry about the pictures. No. <laughs> No, it's, it's no. theatre of the mind apart yes. from anything else. Yes. But you, you're one of the rare people who uh, managed to be enormously successful in music radio. Yes. And then in talk radio. Yes. How did, uh, tell me about that jump. Well, I was always destined for talk radio mm. simply because I was a nosy person growing up. And you're argumentative. <laughs> <laughs> and... And I always, when I see or hear something, uh, I say to myself, I wonder why that is. How does that work? Yes. Why? And so that has driven me 
to a lot of things which, as a result, I thought, hang on, I should be across this. People need to know. And uh, that's always served me well. Yeah. Always served me well. Because I'm, I'm an interested person generally about stuff and so are most people if it affects them, you the know. The trouble with uh, a lot of show business people is that they tend to put you in a box, you know. Yeah. You, you, you know, you are a journalist or you're a newsreader or you are a um, music person or you're a talk person. And really, I've met people in radio who do the whole box and dice. Absolutely. I so know many of them too. Yeah, don't, yeah. don't, don't confine people to sure. a patch. Mm. Open the whole thing up to all you know, the possibilities. Versatility is a wonderful attribute. It sees you through the hard times. Yes, it does. And uh, anybody will tell you this. When you go to a careers advisor, they will tell you that open up your uh, possibilities, don't restrict yourself, yeah. don't be too narrow. Uh, watch trends, be flexible, all those things. Yeah. And if you do that, you will, generally speaking, do a lot better than other people. Yeah. Always. Who, who uh, uh, with executives, you know, I, I, I can cast my mind back and I remember people like Perce Campbell at 2GB yes. and Stan Clark. And, yes. Um, I think there was a guy called Archer at uh, 2UW. Was it Archer or... Um can't remember. But there were, were executives who had a great influence and they seemed to be more inclined to mentor you back then mm. than the people who run radio and television today. Mm. The bloke at TUW was a guy whose name was Frank Jeffcoat. Oh, Frank Jeffcoat, yes, yeah. I know that. He, yeah. was, uh, he was very interested in developing talent yeah. and uh, that's a rare attribute. You don't see it now. You just don't see it. No, they seem to be more interested in wanting to sack it. <laughs> uh, but be well, that as it may. <laughs> well, that's why you, you look in in the media. Versatility is the key. Yeah, what is working today may not work tomorrow. But that's why you have to be constantly moving sure. and changing and evolving yes. with your yeah. audience. Yes, yeah, that's a good thing. They they bring us along. Yeah. Well, you see, I'm I'm always been a nosy person. Mm. I've always wanted to know why something is so. How does it work? How can, how can I adapt to use this? <laughs> and uh, it set me in good stead. He's a Virgo. You. Yeah, I'm a Virgo. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. Tony's really? a Virgo. Is that right? <laughs> two, two weeks to his birthday. Two weeks to your birthday? Yeah. Oh, good, good. Uh, Andy, what are you? Cancer. Cancer? Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have, you, have, you, have, you got, have you got any more Leon in there? Oh. Yeah, you've got one? Hit the red button. Hit the red button. Oh, yeah. I play a Leon by now. Good song. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you really made it when you have a singing jingle. Oh, yeah, that was, a, that was an interesting time because uh, if you worked for a radio station and uh, you did a, a, a prime shift, mm. they would have the jingle department mm. uh, yeah. sing yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but it was, uh, it was big time, wasn't yes. it? Yes. Oh, yeah. Radio stations at that time spent enormous amounts of money on jingles. Yeah. You know. It was all part of the pizzazz. It was, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, people, people uh, you know, buy the sizzle, not the steak. Correct. It's, you know, it's, it's, mm. it's a, a tricky thing. Mm. Uh, w- w- since you left AA, and I still don't know why you left AA, people ask me, why did Leon Biner leave AA? It wasn't, it wasn't fully my decision to do that. Well, what possibly could be their thinking on that? I don't know. I, I, I'm not a good mind reader, uh, uh, so I don't know. But um, I get asked that question more than you can imagine. I don't know. No, Everywhere I go. If people why ask you me, on the radio? I'm sure they'd be asking you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, I get asked all the time when I go to the shops, whatever, yeah. the vet, the florist, <laughs> yeah. when are you going to be on radio again? 
Well, that's a good question. When are you? I don't know. Uh, but I've got a feeling that things might turn soon. I just have that feeling. Yes. Yes, I think the, the whole thing is pregnant with possibilities. <laughs> yes, yeah. And, you know, I, I'm a nosy and interested person in so many things, so I like to keep across of what's going on. Yeah, when I watch uh, some of these current affairs programs on television, it amazes me how the journalist, it's almost like he or she has a clipboard and all the questions are written down and as soon as the bloke stops talking, well, you go to the next question. When in actual fact... That answer has provoked yes. a, a whole lot of questions that have to be asked. Yes, I remember years and years ago when I was uh, around people who really knew what they were doing and wonderful mentors, the thing they said more than anything that you need to do if you're going to be... Listen. Yeah. Listen, yes. If you're a great listener, yeah. you will do well. Yeah. Because what happens is... A lot of people in the journo business now just have their list of questions. Yeah. They don't really pay a lot of attention to many of the answers, which often can contain things that are worth pursuing, yeah, yeah. and they just go down the list. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, having a set of ears mm. is not a bad thing. <laughs> not a bad thing when you're, <laughs> when you're doing this. It would be interesting to set something up so that in the middle of your answer while the bloke was busy looking for his next question, um, you know, you slipped in and, oh, by the way, I murdered my wife this morning. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> yes. And then he'd come back and say, well, I, I see that you sold the old blue car and uh, w what made you buy the new one? Because that's his next question. Uh, maybe he didn't even write the next question. No. <laughs> um, <yeah. laughs> Look, in, in this business... Mm -hmm. You kind of need to be an interested person in a whole lot of things. Yeah. And you also need to have information mm. that not necessarily everybody has. Mm. Because, look, if you can't tell people something they didn't know or couldn't get from the paper, yeah. you're not doing your job. Sorry. No, no. I've often thought that uh, the morning newspaper is... Uh uh, well, it's certainly a friend, but it can also be an enemy because you are confined to that when in actual fact you should be able to think around it. Don't ring up the person who is quoted in the morning paper and get him to come on your program and repeat what he has said in the morning newspaper. But you've got to think of it, 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 there's got to be another yes. angle. Take the story the next totally step. Totally agree. Take I've always worked further. that way, Jeremy, yeah, 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 always. Yeah. Well, that's why your programs have always worked. Remarkably well. In fact, I've never known you to to bomb. You've never had a bad survey no. that I can remember. No. Oh, look, uh, you can get them, but look, the, the overriding principle is if you pursue the right things that people care about yes. or are interested in yes. and you take uh, a neutral position, you can have your own opinion, but if you take a position to get answers to important things, you're never going to go wrong. Yeah, yeah. You're never going to go wrong. Now, if you want to speak to Leon, if you're, you're suffering with brawls because you haven't <laughs> spoken to him for a while, it's 0491 656860. It's a good number, Leon. Yeah. It's, it's kind of got some iambic pentameter or something going for it. <laughs> Don't ask me what that is because I've got no idea. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. No, it's, it sounds it sounds good. I see that the energy regulator has sounded this clear warning. Oh you, God! Uh, this summer is going to see South Australia uh, and Victoria with failures on the electricity grid. Now you see, I I've got a real issue with the way this country is deliberately impoverishing itself. Yeah. For no we, reason. Yeah. We, we, okay, a lot of people don't like coal. We export billions of dollars worth to other countries. And they merrily use it and yes. we can't. Yeah. It's only one atmosphere. Yes. If they're putting it up there or yeah. we are putting it up here, it's the same thing. The, the great irony of all this, you know, Jeremy, and I, I, I never cease to be amazed by this, is the twisted logic because we, we export all this uh, energy to other countries. Yes. We decide that we don't really want to use it ourselves. 
we then allow those countries to whom we export this cheap energy mm. to come back and compete with us and make stuff at a price we can't afford to. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> so you can see just from that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how cost ineffective we make it ourselves. Uh, look. It's I, illogical. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes no sense. And when Australia is uh, contributing 1.3%, of global emissions, yes, uh, we could we could close down the entire country and nobody would notice. Correct, correct. So, yet, yet we have we have this really strange situation whereby I, I can find the quote in here. Where was the quote? It was about the grid. Yeah, uh, governments will allow ideology to cloud their judgment and will pay the price. Um, but the point they make here is that the renewables are not going to be online in time no. to fill the gap. So why would it be that we'd be closing down conventional power or coal-fired power stations prematurely? We would only close those down when we had the renewables on tap. Look, in my view, governments don't prioritise very well. The most important thing that people need is that when they throw the electric switch it turns on. Yes, we have come to expect yeah, that. Yes, <laughs> and and I think we've lost that to some extent. And to say, well, ah, oh, I haven't got much power today, uh, is just naive and stupid. We are an energy-rich country, Jeremy. Abundant. Yeah. We've got minerals and wealth beneath our feet that covers everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yet we treat ourselves as if... None of that exists. No. That we have to bring it in, which we don't. No. It's all under our feet. Yeah. And I, I just wish that we could get the ideological politics out of this. And well, you'd just, have to just get the left wing out of the country. <laughs> yeah, well, look, what is important is uh, people need energy. Now, I mean, you think about it. If you, if, you, if you didn't have electricity... Yeah. What the hell would you do? But as a country, if you are given certain blessings, if yes. you're given certain assets, yes. can you imagine somebody turning up and, uh, at the front door of Saudi Arabia and saying, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Sheikh, um, uh, we don't want you to uh, pump any more oil. I mean, you would be, uh, you, your head would be off or yes. you, your legs would be gone, yeah. but you certainly wouldn't be listened to. And yet we've got these people who white ant this beautiful country by saying, oh, no, yes, you've got uh, uranium, you've got abundant gas and coal, uh, every resource you could think of, you're energy rich, but you can't use it. Why do we listen to such nonsense? Look, I think the, the worm will turn here and it'll be sooner than later. That's my feedback on this. And... Because, you know, you've got to give people the opportunity of either cooling or warming their house, of being able to put the dishwashing machine on or indeed uh, the, the, the laundry appliances that you've got to do your clothes or whatever. Right. Uh, or to cook. So, look, whatever we do, someone's not going to be happy. No, well, I mean... But you know, I mean, that's be, the truth uh, of it, But isn't we it? should have uh, uh, patriotic... Not political. We must do what is good for the people, what is good for the country, yeah. not the ideology. Um, Tony's got me something here which I think is from 2GB. Can we, can we listen to this? Okay, let's have a listen. Exclusions apply. Before buying insurance issued by GIO, read the PDS. Call for a copy. TMD also That's available. a free Right now we're getting ready to talk to Canada and we want to talk about nuclear power and small modular reactors. They are the small nuclear plants that can be plugged into the grid. They're about the size of a shipping container and they have lots of upsides. Their small scale means they cost less to build and there's not as much anxiety around these types of reactors because they are a lot smaller. More than 30 countries around the world have got nuclear energy, but the technology has been banned in Australia since the late 1990s, despite having some of the largest reserves of the key ingredient, uranium. So let's find out how this is working on the other side of the world. We're taking it to Canada, where nuclear provides up to 15% of their total energy needs. And they're looking into small nuclear reactors. By the end of the decade, they expect this reactor to start supplying enough energy... 
for 1.2 million homes and they're free from emissions. Todd Smith is the Energy Minister for Ontario and he joins me on the line. G'day, Todd. Hi, Ben. A pleasure to join you today. Thank you very much for talking to us. So you guys are powered by nuclear energy. Does it surprise you when you find out that in Australia we've got all of this uranium and we don't use nuclear? (laughs) <laughs> well, a little bit. Yeah, sure. I mean, Canada is one of the largest uh, uranium deposits as well. And uh, we've been putting that uranium to good use for about 50 to 60 years here in Canada. And I'm the minister for the largest province in Canada, Ontario. And uh, nuclear has provided about 60% of our electricity, uh, reliable, affordable and non-emitting uh, nuclear power for the last 50 or 60 years. So it's been a real success story for our province. Todd, our energy minister in Australia, Chris Bowen, has given five reasons why we should not embrace nuclear power. So I wouldn't mind getting a quick comment from you on these. First of all, number one, he says nuclear power is the most expensive form of energy available. Uh, Well, that hasn't certainly been the case in Ontario, and I can only tell you what's happened here in Ontario, but we're producing our nuclear power for about uh, now 9 or 10 cents a kilowatt hour in this province. Uh, You know, the previous Liberal government, which is uh, the left-wing government that we had in Ontario, was paying exorbitant subsidies to uh, uh, renewable projects like wind and solar, which was driving up electricity and also was very unreliable and unstable. Um, Nuclear power is baseload power. It's there 24-7, 365. It's power that you can count on at a very competitive rate at about 9 or 10 cents a kilowatt hour now, and it employs about 76,000 workers in our province and in our country. He also says the small modular reactor technology is unproven. Well, I would say he's sort of right on that, although uh, we do have a technology that we've chosen here in, uh, in Ontario that's based on the boiling water reactor, which is proven technology that we've had, um, you know, for 50 or 60 years. So it's just a smaller scaled down version of what we've had operating in North America for a long, long time. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we like about the small modular reactor, uh, the BWRX-300, the one that we're building at our Darlington nuclear plant here in Ontario, is that um, not only is it going to be smaller and more flexible, meaning you can locate it uh, in places where you would be able to phase out coal uh, at coal locations right now, um, but it is a proven safe technology. Yeah, and that's different to what our energy minister says, where he says it's it's not a flexible source of energy. He also says that small modular reactors would produce no small amount of waste. So what's the the waste component? Well, I can tell you that um, our CANDU reactors that we have operating across Ontario now Uh, the spent fuel or the waste uh, that has come from those facilities over 50 years fits on the size of a football field. Uh, So it's not a lot of waste. It's uh, actually, um, uh, and the small modular reactors will produce even less waste than that. And there are currently plans with some emerging technology to use spent nuclear fuel as well in uh, future technology um, for small modular reactors. So uh, There is a plan to deal with waste in Ontario. It's a federal agency, the Nuclear Waste Management Organization, uh, that is currently citing a deep geological repository uh, for that waste. But it's generally very, very small. And, you know, I've heard uh, different um, analogies from the folks in the nuclear sector talking about the fact that uh, if you were to go per capita per person in our country, uh, the amount of waste that one person would consume in their lifetime is the equivalent to a Coke can, a Coca-Cola can. And then this is a crazy thing because we're, we're making these changes as far as our energy sources go because we want to protect the planet for the generations to come. But when you've got nuclear, we're afraid of adopting it in Australia, even though it's environmentally friendly. Well, yeah, it's non-emitting. And, uh, you know, our federal government has come around a long way on nuclear uh, as being the only pathway to net zero because of the reliability factor, because of the amount of energy that can be produced from a very, very small footprint. 
um, you know, you're talking uh, about a very small chunk of land uh, that produces enormous amounts of megawatts. And so it makes sense because it's power that's going to be there. It's power you can rely on. And it's a very, very small footprint for these facilities. So we're seeing a big sea change, uh, not just here in our country in Canada, but also around the world when it comes to uh, nuclear. Many countries in Europe that made the mistake, and they admit that they made the mistake to shut down their nuclear plants, are now going back to reopening those nuclear facilities. And, uh, you know, uh, our advice here in Ontario is uh, to continue on the path of, uh, of nuclear. And we're seeing some of the biggest polluters in the world, like Poland, uh, deciding that nuclear is the way that they can phase out coal and do what we've done here in Ontario and clean up our emissions from the electricity sector. We're relying on wind and solar as part of our transition. Can you give us a comment on that? Well, um, for a time, uh, our government here moved uh, on wind and solar in a big, big way, and it's created some serious problems for our our system operator. And uh, even some uh, provinces here in Canada this week have had challenges uh, with having an unreliable system. You, You have to have generators that you can count on. You can't see economic development if you have unreliable uh, power in your jurisdiction. So uh, nuclear is a baseload, non-emitting power source that you can count on to be there so you can see economic development. And we've had enormous economic development of late here in Ontario, major investments in the electric vehicle sector and EV battery sector, uh, a lot of immigration happening here. So we have to build a lot of homes and we're seeing manufacturers moving to electrification as well, getting away from natural gas and coal-fired facilities um, to to uh, grow uh, electrification in the manufacturing sector. So I would say, uh, in a nutshell, it's been a very, very big success story for our province. And your advice to Australia, don't be afraid of going nuclear. No, and if you have questions about nuclear, contact a jurisdiction that has relied on nuclear for 50 or 60 years. We've had a number of your MPs that have come over and visited Ontario and had a conversation with us, and uh, don't be afraid to check it out. I'll tell you, it's a great success story, especially our can-do fleet, and now we're really excited about where the small modular reactor is going. It is the answer. It's energy autonomy, it's energy security, and it's reliability that uh, jurisdictions are looking for to power their growing communities. I've got an idea, Todd. We might swap you with our energy minister. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'd love to come down for a visit, that's for sure. (laughs) Yeah, we'll we'll fast-track your Australian citizenship and we'll make you the energy minister of Australia. Sounds like thank you, Ben. I think ben, my wife would actually. It sounds like a good well. idea. That's Ben right, Fordham. Well, we'll just end it there. There we are. Yeah. Well, that, that's to me uh, very persuasive, and it could be plain ignorant for a country like Australia not to explore that. It's all about Greens' preferences. Well, let's get rid of the Greens. Well, you see. <laughs> well, let's get rid of Labor. Uh, the the politics of this <laughs> is that uh, if you've got an ally who can get you seats or get you elected, the last thing you want to do, and this is from a political pragmatism point of view, is upset them. And uh, that's really what this is about. Well, these guys are in Canberra to look after the interests of Australia and Australians. We would hope so. And they are not doing that. We would hope so, yes. Okay, not to explore uh, that sort of technology and to do it out of plain ignorance and political bias, and still get elected, is pretty amazing. You know, the irony of this, Jeremy, is that Australia has a very significant amount of uranium. Yes, indeed. And we send it away for other people to use. Yes, but we're not allowed to do it ourselves. No. Uh, Do you you remember that kerfuffle when, uh, I think it was Western Mining? Mm. Uh, Hugh Morgan, I think, was the head of Western Mining at the time. And uh, they had discovered this incredible um, uranium deposit yes. at Roxby Downs. Yeah. And we, or the Labor Party in power at the time, would not let it be developed. And the only reason it was developed was that one man, one Labor guy, and I think his name was Normie Foster. Yes. You remember Normie yes, Foster? Yes, I remember Norm Foster. And he crossed the floor which is a totally verboten in mm. the world of Labor. 
Yeah. And he was ostracised and humiliated and castigated and, well, I think he died a broken, a broken man. But he did, for South Australia, a wonderfully generous thing that his political party would not. Now, to me, in, in uh, Sydney, we have, for 60 years, we have had a full-on nuclear reactor. Yes, Lucas Heights. Lucas Heights, and yeah. it, it certainly hasn't blown up. No. It, it, it was, admittedly, when it was built out in the sticks, but suburbia has crept up and there are suburban houses all around. You know what the great irony of all this is, that uh, nuclear medicine now is a very big part yeah. of uh, the treatment of the sick people. Oh, absolutely. And it has enabled many who may not have survived to live very full lives. Yes, indeed. Yes, And yes, yes. we should never forget that, you know. No. Sometimes, you know, w- when, you, when you've got an ideology, that's fine, but the ideology's got to work for the person, not the person work for the ideology. Mm. And I think sometimes Australia gets a little bit caught up in its own bind on this stuff. You know, we... We've got a lot of minerals and wealth under our feet. Mm. And what we should be doing is making sure that whatever we've got that can advantage us yes. and we can use to help and enrich totally the agree. lives of everybody, totally we should use. Yep, the common wealth. Yes. It is our, our great luck, if you like. Yeah. But we extend it out a bit further from nuclear medicine where the, uh, um, oh, I don't know what they are, gowns and maybe... Bits and pieces of yes. medical equipment, low-grade yeah. nuclear uh, medical bits and pieces stored at the moment in North Terrace, I'm told, in uh, lift, lift wells. wells. Lift wells lift and wells. stairwells and things like that. Uh, if, it's, if it's safe to do that in North Terrace, it would be certainly okay to do it at Kimber. But no, we can't do it at Kimber because the Aboriginals won't have it and we have a federal government that won't tackle them on their superstitious rubbish. Yeah, look, ultimately, Australia will have to see the way here. Yeah. I I think, you know, we're a very, very lucky country in more ways than one. But we can run out of luck. Well, yes, we can. But we we are fortunate in that so much of what's under our feet can enrich the population. Because we've got so much mineral wealth here in Australia... And uh, the amount of people who pay massive taxes developing that wealth, which pays for the social programs that often we're demanding, Mm -hmm. is quite extraordinary. So I think we we, we must never lose faith in what we're actually doing and for whom it benefits. Because I think sometimes, you know, you can get... I understand that there are people who are uncomfortable with nuclear energy. I understand that. But you know what? Uh, the from the people I've spoken to across the board at unis and so on that know this stuff and eat, sleep and drink it, have all said we've come a long way with that technology now in terms of safety matters, and that we would be fools. I mean, we've got we've got a very very rich supply of uranium yes. in Australia. Yes, we'd be fools not to use it. It's like uh, the medical world coming to us and saying, look, we, we can cure various cancers. We can do this and mm. we can do that with nuclear medicine. Yeah. And for p- p- strange flat earth political <laughs> reasons, the, the, the government says, oh, no, no, we can't do it. No, let, 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 them, let them die. Let them mm. die. Yeah. The same thing applies to other uses for nuclear power. And while those uses are there and the nuclear energy is at our fingertips, our uranium resources are there for us to use, as you point out. Yes. The government is plain crazy. Why wouldn't we, why would we not, with this referendum that's coming up, put another question, because that would be pretty cheap, and the question would be to approve or disapprove of nuclear power in Australia. Government won't (laughs) touch it with a barge pole. Why? Trust me. But a democratic vote like that, I yes, think, would I be know. very interesting. Yes, I know. But you see, uh, a lot of people in, in office, in government office, rely on preferences from a group which, if they didn't get their support, would 
probably not be in government. Would it surprise you to know I wouldn't care if they were in government or out of government? No, it wouldn't surprise me to know. <laughs> but that's the, the reality, but though. The, that's the, what the we're people, dealing with. The people should yeah. decide about yeah, nuclear power. Yeah, of course power. they should. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, you know, I, I've i got uh, relatives who've had the benefit of nuclear medicine. Yes. So have I. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, most people listening yes. will, will have an experience. Will have been touched by yes. it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. So we're fools to ignore the sort of technology which can actually help you live a fulfilling life. Mm-hmm. How silly it would be to reject that. And this summer coming when the uh, regulator says quite openly, South Australia and Victoria uh, have a place on the grid that is very fragile. You Jeez. are going to have blackouts. And this government is going to allow it. Yeah, see, I, uh, I'm i lucky. I saw this coming 10 years ago and I raided my super and I put in a battery and solar. Yeah. And it was the best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. Because I could see from all the, you know, you're, uh, as you and I and people listening hear what is being said, mm. we're basically being told that we're going to be devoid of energy. Which for a country like Australia, hmm. with with all of the resources we've got, is just unfathomable. But are we Seriously. going to let them get away with that? Well, I think the penny is starting to drop, mm. albeit very slowly, on this matter. Because, mate, let me tell you, when your ordinary person mm. gets home of a day and flicks the switch, woe betide if the lights don't go on. Yes, yes. Woe betide. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't want to be around an election day when the lights <laughs> yes. when the lights don't come on. But but mate, that's the that's the that's the real test here. You see, the real test. Yeah, so. but when you say it was the best thing you ever did, uh, I hear these conflicting stories about people putting the system in and then finding that they get bigger bigger bills. Oh well, if that happens, you've got something wrong with your system. Because I mm. I made a, a, a very, I mean, I did a bit of research. And um, I've got to say that uh, I don't regret it because, you know, I, I put in solar and batteries years ago, best thing I ever did, mm-hmm. best thing I ever did. And now I've got people coming to me wanting to see what I did. Mm. And I'm thinking, was it that clever? I just, I just wanted to make sure I had power when we needed it. What is the, the life of a system like that? Uh, do you get, oh. you get stuck with having to replace the oh. solar collectors? No, no. Easily you get 20 years out of it, probably more. Yeah. yeah. And see, the other thing is that solar technology now is far superior than what it was even five years ago. Yeah. So your average panel uh, delivers a more efficient energy than what even five years ago you could get. Yeah. So things are, you know, and, and the other good thing is because a lot of people are doing it, the price is coming down. Yeah. Does your system handle blackouts as well? Yes. Uh, my system handles blackouts. See, I've got an app. I'll do a kind of a uh, – I'm just looking it up now because you can do it. It's very clever how you can get an app on your phone on this. But I've got an energy app. And it tells me how much battery power I've got. And if, for some reason, the grid went down, I would still have power. Mm. And uh, unless the grid stayed down for more than a couple of hours, probably a lot more, you might be in a little bit of trouble. So the battery's good for a couple of hours. Oh, easy. Oh, you'd probably get a few hours out of it. And see, the thing is this. On a day where it's sunny, you're running off your solar anyway. You're not using grid. No. If if you've got it set up right. Yeah. Because I I went into this thing really carefully a while ago because I thought, how are the poor strugglers going to work with this? And now you can do all sorts of deals, even if you haven't got a lot of ready capital, Mm. so that because if your power bill, energy costs are going up, so having solar represents a, uh, a very important investment to knock your bill right down. What happens, though, when more and more people, say, go uh, independent with a, a solar solar system? The, the weight <coughs> on the people who are still on the grid is going to be intolerable. Oh, I'm not sure that's entirely correct. There's been a view put out that says that. 
but uh, you've got to have the grid there. You can't. Uh, there are some people who maybe could run totally independent, but that's not really what you want to do. You just want to make sure that when you get home and you yeah, put the switch on. on, the lights come on. That's yeah, all. No, that's that's perfectly right. So uh, it's not. <clears throat> it ain't rocket science, and we're lucky because uh, you know you could go. I mean, I've got a I've got an app. I'll just have a look at it and describe it. But uh, it says, see, I've got a heat It's got carbon track. Let's go into it and just see where the battery's at. Now, I bet it's 100% charged because at the moment I wouldn't be using the battery because you've got the solar, which is, uh, see, here we go. My battery's 100%, right? Yep. So I would be running off the sunlight today. Not even using the battery. It's a bit cloudy now. Yeah, but... but, but there's enough there to charge the... Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, right. that has to be 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that's pretty good. On a day that's inclement, where it's a bit cloudy, to be 100% on your battery yeah. at, say, lunchtime is pretty good. Will you come back and see us again? Of course I will. Good, good. I'll just good. wait for the invite. No, it's the standing invitation. <laughs> standing invitation. Um, <laughs> just quickly, because we're running out of time. And, yeah. Uh, Tony tells me, we've got to finish on time. <laughs> I just have this wonderful feeling with this sure. system. We don't have to do anything. It's a Virgo thing. A Virgo thing. <laughs> How do you think the um, referendum is going to go? It won't get up. No, I don't think it'll get up either, but what a waste of money. Look, I, I can tell you that in my view of talking with people, and I love doing that to find out what the temperature is on things, yeah. They're not too committed to this. They don't really care. Don't they don't see that it touches them. No. They don't see that it's relevant to them. I know for some people it is, but for the majority, they just say, what are you talking about? No. I mean, even Aboriginals are divided over it, let alone the uh, white uh, versus black or black versus white community. And there is just too much doubt. I'm uh, The safest thing in the world is, if in doubt, don't. Well, the polling suggests the no's going to get up. Yeah. And, and I, I can't see any big watershed of change that's going to make that any different. No, I agree with you. No, great to see you. Likewise. You look very well. Thank you. Just enjoy the rest because I sense somehow you're not going to have too much of it. No. Uh, uh, whatever's I, uh, looming is, is, uh, which is a wonderful thing about, uh, about uh, the business because you're just it's in a constant state of movement. Yes. Well, see, being the nosy person I am... Mm. Always asking questions and something happens and I think, hang on a minute, I wonder why that's happening. And yeah. then you pull the rug and see what's going on. You think, hang yeah. on a minute, I better pull more of this. Look under the rug. Yes. <laughs> and uh, that's where all the secrets are. <laughs> okay, well, we've got to go. Lovely to see Thank you. you. Leon Biner, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks very much for being with us. Now we'll have the podcast Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week and, of course, the Facebook page from the garage. Thank you very much for being part of jeremycordo.com. Uh, look after yourselves, have a lovely weekend, and goodbye for now. When you're all alone and blue, no one to tell your troubles to. Remember me, I'm the one who loves you. When this whole world turns you down, not a true friend can.